Last year, it was Billy Thompson's place. That's okay. No one really likes him anyway. Everyone pretends, though, because we gave them a going away party. I remember standing there watching my dad drink a beer and commenting about how everyone was putting on a fake face. I don't really know what that means. How do you put on a face that isn't yours? Dad drinks a lot, especially when he's upset. Him and Billy's dad worked together over at the factory, so I know he was mad that they had to go. I didn't understand it then, and I don't understand it now. Their house is nice. It's a two-story with a big backyard, which includes a swing set and sand pit that I loved to play in when I was little. I'm almost 10 now, so that stuff's for babies. Besides, there isn't a sand pit there anymore, even if I wanted to play in it anyway. No, there's just a big blank yard. Billy's house is gone. His dad's car is gone. Even a swing set in the grass is gone. Now there's just this strange white dirt that dad says we aren't supposed to touch. My younger sister Tammy did it a few weeks ago, and I think that's why things are going bad for us now. She says she can't feel her foot anymore. I didn't tell dad. I was scared that I would get in trouble for playing too close to the blank yard. Dad's been drinking a lot more recently. I think it's because he knows that we're going to be next. The next house to go away, I mean. Is it because Tammy touched the white dirt? That scares me. I feel bad for even getting that close. But it's weird, right? Houses that just vanish for no reason. I remember when Billy's house vanished, there was this weird shimmer right before it happened. Everyone felt a little sleepy, and then they were gone. Not demolished, but just up and vanished into thin air. I remember asking Dad why this happened, and he admitted he didn't know. In fact, nobody in our neighborhood does. That's scary, too. We all know that it's going to happen, and that someday it might happen to us. No one is sure when it started. Mr. Clark has lived here for about 60 years. He says that something happened in his backyard in the 70s, and ever since then, houses have just been vanishing. The only thing that's the same is when it happens. We know that at least a year has to pass by before another house is taken. Leap years don't seem to throw this off either, oddly enough. I think it's like a ghost or something. Like a big, house-swallowing monster. That makes me think of the old cartoon movie, at Monster House. I needed to watch that again. Maybe if I watch it, I won't be so scared about the fact that our house is next. I'm sure our house is next because my good friend Sam told me the other day that it started to shimmer. For some reason, we can't see the shimmer, but everyone else in the neighborhood can. So we know it won't be long. Dad's tried to be strong and not be scared. I can tell he's starting to crack under the pressure. I really wanted to ask what happens after the house vanishes. But I get the feeling he doesn't know. I asked Mr. Clark about it the other day, because the house next to him was also blank spaced, and he admitted that he thinks the houses are still there. We must not be able to see him is what I think. I mean, it's been obvious that no one can build on the white dirt. So it just makes more and more empty space. House values are going down all around. Nobody wants to live here anymore, he told me. So why don't we just leave the neighborhood, I asked. Can't. I know you are young and you don't understand how things work, but banks and corporations own these houses. Only thing that keeps them here is mortgage payments. Otherwise, we'd be homeless, boy, he told me. I thought about it for a second. Maybe being homeless is better than being vanished, I asked. But he didn't feel like talking about it anymore. Tammy was feeling sick that night. She has a hard time with her foot, too, because of the white dirt. Dad's growing suspicious. I'm, I'm really scared he's going to find out. I think tomorrow's the day we're going to be gone. The house will disappear, and we will, too, I think. Where are we going to go? Will we just be invisible and no one can see us? I wish I knew why Dad moved us here to begin with, or why we can't move. There's a lot that I don't understand. I thought as I grew older, I would, but it's just made me worry. I don't like being 10. 
It was easier when I was seven. And I saw a house vanish. Everyone in the neighborhood just acted like it was normal. So it didn't really scare me. I didn't notice dad drink back then, but I'm sure he did. Maybe I was just more innocent. Is that, is that why vanishing is taking us away? Because I don't like that it's taking my friends and neighbors one by one. Miss Yoki lived down the street, and she says the neighborhood is cursed. Something about old sins being rectified because of the vanishing. So does that mean that Dad did something bad and that's why we're going to disappear? I don't like being so scared about something I don't understand and can't stop, I told her. It's always been that way. But just remember, when it's over, you won't have anything to worry about anymore. You'll be fine. One day, my house will vanish too. Then I can be free, she said with a smile. Does she mean that I would die? It sounded like it. I don't want to have to pay for my dad's curse. It makes me angry. I want to leave. I tried to. Yesterday, I got so mad because dad was drunk and passed out on the couch, and I took Tammy and started for the end of the neighborhood. We've been beyond our neighborhood plenty of times, not... Not very many visitors, though. Mr. Clark says that everyone around us tries to ignore us. They don't want the emptiness to spread, he explained. I wish I knew what that means, but... I do know that once I pass Sorrel Street, that I don't see any more blank houses. So that means it only affects us, right? Although it does make me wonder... What will happen 50 years from now when all the houses are gone? I guess if we're invisible, we can all be invisible neighbors together. But as we pass Billy's vacant lot where, where his house once stood, I realize this can't be the truth. It feels so cold and dead there. Like, like the house took away all that was good from the area when it vanished. Maybe it took the color, too. Is that why it looks so... bleak? It makes me feel uneasy to even go near it. But this is the closest way out of the neighborhood. My plan, if I have one, is to get out and call Mom. She managed to leave a few years back, so that must mean that we're safe to leave, too, right? I just don't understand why everyone's okay with us staying here and vanishing along with the house. We can leave. We're almost at the last house. This one belongs to a family that I haven't met, but it seems nice enough. It reminds me of every other house in the neighborhood. And then I, I, I felt a little lost. I couldn't make heads or tails of anything. I got vertigo. I once got vertigo as a kid, and I got dizzy, and I couldn't stand up straight all day. That's how it felt. Tammy was there to help me, and she kept me from puking. When I came to, we were... We were still in the neighborhood. And I realized that somehow we had traveled back towards our house. I asked Tammy about it, but she didn't know. It... It made me feel very uneasy, because all our neighbors were watching us making me feel like we weren't allowed to leave. Maybe we can't. They've been standing out now for a few hours, a few of them setting up lawn chairs to watch the vanishing. They look so... ordinary. Dad used the word... complacent. Like, they, they didn't care we're about to be swallowed up by... whatever this is. Maybe they don't care. I want to ask them why, but Dad says not to bother them. We're going to have a family dinner tonight and then say our goodbyes. Somehow he's sobering up. At dinner, Tammy is shaky and starts to cry. Then she admits to Dad about touching the white dirt. He looks angry, but I don't see him offering any words of comfort. It makes me think that Tammy's the reason we're going to vanish. We tampered with something we don't understand. One of the neighbors came by and offered to let us use their phone in case we wanted to call someone. Last year it worked. 
Maybe you can call Tess, say you're sorry, the man asked. Dad looked angry that the man had talked about my mom, and I thought there was going to be a fight, but instead he just passed the phone to me and told me I could do whatever I wanted. That was about four hours ago. Sometime tonight, the house and me and my family inside will be gone. I can't sleep because I'm so terrified of what's going to happen. I can't leave because the neighbors won't let us. I know they seem friendly, but honestly, I think they would stop us too if we, if we wanted to leave. I think they're making sure we vanish. That way, it doesn't happen to them next. Maybe it's like feeding a hungry wild animal. Keep it happy and fed and it won't turn on you. I did try to call mom. I was blubbering so much, trying to explain what was happening, but she told me to let go. Sweetie, it's going to be okay. You can move on now. Be with grandpa. That made me smile. I would like that very much. I'm holding Tammy now and looking at the neighbors, trying to remember which one of them said that letting go is hard. They have no idea. It's not just hard for the people we're leaving behind. It's terrifying me. I don't know what's next. The shimmering is getting brighter. I, I should probably go now. I don't think I'll get a chance to finish this last bit of ice cream. I wish I did. I really wish I did. Remember to smile. The people at home don't want to see any frowny faces, okay? Got it. The woman marched quickly away, saying something into her headset, then glancing down at the clipboard in her hand. Lights were shining hot on my face. Cameras pointed at me, and I felt myself sweating. Warm drips of it ran down my chin, but I was too afraid to wipe them away. Slowly, the host walked onto the stage. A slim, short kid with slicked back blonde hair and a dark suit, who appeared no more than 20 years old, if not younger. He ignored us and looked at the cameras, checking to make sure everything was ready, as if he was the one running the whole show. Finally, when everything was set, he glanced back at us and gave a quick, show-stopping smile. His pearly white teeth sparkled in the bright lights, his eyes dark as night but glimmering with intelligence. All set, folks? We nodded nervously. I quickly looked at my two competitors, a tall, athletic man named Dan, who ran a catering company, and a woman named Susan, who was a private chef. Being the executive chef at a well-respected restaurant, I felt confident in my chances to win the cooking battle against the two of them. I had 20 years of experience and culinary school education under my belt. Of course, I had no idea what I was in for. None of us did. Not yet. The bright light shone in my eyes, obscuring my vision, and I heard someone begin to count down. Okay, everybody, we are alive in five, four. The woman stopped counting out loud, and only her fingers could be seen in the glare held up, and letting us know how long until the camera started to roll. Three, two, one. She pointed at the host who spoke his opening lines seamlessly and with practice effort. Hello everyone and welcome to The Chopping Block, the only live TV cooking competition of its kind. I'm your host, El Tilnatus, and as always, our judge is the one, the only, Bub Belzy. You folks at home know how the game works. There's only two rounds and our competitors will receive a mystery cauldron full of ingredients and will be forced to make a dish using each item. Then we'll be tasting each and every dish to find out who's going to be on the chopping block. <laughs> he turned and looked at us with his showman grin. I was slightly surprised this egomaniac hadn't arranged for a studio audience. It seemed like just a show for that sort of thing. Cheesy and over the top. Ready, contestants. We nodded our heads, excitedly, still not knowing what was coming. We'd find out soon enough, though. One by one. Okay, bring down the cauldrons! Three massive cauldrons were lowered from the ceiling by ropes until they settled on the floor. I tried to smile and not think about the cameras pointing at me. The lights shone hot on me from the ceiling, the audience watching at home. 
Not that I had ever seen or heard of this show before, but I guess a lot of people probably watched it. Dan, Susan, and I began to open the cauldron lids. One by one, our faces turned sour as we grimaced and looked at each other with confused disgust. What is that? I exclaimed. I couldn't help it. The black pot was full of blood and undeterminate organs. I guess they were from a pig or a cow, but I wasn't really sure. The size of them wasn't quite right either. Venison, maybe, I wondered, but no, it wasn't that either. The clock was ticking, so I didn't think about it too much. I had worked with Awful before, so I just dug my hands in and grabbed each of the four slippery, blood-soaked organs and ran them over to the sink. Maybe this was a Halloween episode they were filming in advance, I thought to myself. That would explain the cauldrons and the blood-soaked entrails. I just wished they had said something because it caught me so off guard. But then the two contestants looked uncertain as well. They were still working up the courage to examine the cuts more carefully. I poked at the bloody bits with fingers and made faces. The thought occurred to me again that I might win this competition. I just I just couldn't afford to get cocky. After rinsing up the organs in the sink, I got a better look at them. It was a heart, a liver, as well as a pair of kidneys. Still unable to determine which species of creatures they came from, I decided to just wing it and saute the liver and kidneys, then process them to make a spread for a tartine. There wasn't a lot of time for anything else. The round ended with a loud buzzer, and I felt pretty confident, having a decent looking dish to present. The fact was not lost on the host of the show. Edel Mattis looked at us one by one and scoffed at everyone's dish but mine. The other two were not particularly well plated. I hate to say, still, Dan managed to make a passable flatbread and Susan prepared a handmade pasta, although I could tell that she struggled with the time constraints. Her ravioli had exploded in the boiling water, resulting in her filling being mostly lost. Okay, time for judging. The host looked at our plates. We went back behind a black curtain, which was set off to the side. I presume this was where the judge sat, but it was odd that we didn't get to meet him. About ten minutes later, the host came back with one covered plate in his hand. Okay, time to find out who is on the chopping block tonight. He lifted the dome and revealed Susan's exploded ravioli. I saw her cover her face with her hands in shame. Sorry, Susan. Bub thought your ravioli was well cooked, but unfortunately we both found it salty, and your filling sadly did not make the plate. For those reasons, you've been selected for the chopping block. I understand. Thank you for the opportunity, she said. I went over to shake his hand. Please exit behind the black curtain, the young host said, looking sympathetic, and be well. We took a break after that for half an hour before moving on so that we could drink some water and use the restroom if needed. The next round began and the cauldrons were lowered down once again and Dan and I set to work grabbing ingredients from them. This time it was a small piece of meat that looked freshly carved and bloody, floating in a sanguineous bath at the bottom of the cauldron. The bub and I are still hungry, said the host enthusiastically. Make us a nice filling entree this round. We set to work and I fulfilled his request, creating a hamburger from the strange-looking bits of meat. It was quite lean, so I, I added a hunk of beef fat from the fridge for the perfect 70-30 meat-fat ratio. Then I formed the patties with my hands. The, the smell was... It, it was so strange. Not lamb or beef or pork or venison. It wasn't goat or emu either. I, I tried those as well, and I was fairly certain that this was a meat I'd never eaten before. I nibbled on the cook pieces, tasting it for seasoning. I just hoped that we'd find out what it was at the end of the show, since I was pretty curious, to be honest. The time expired and the buzzer went off again. Time's up! Bring your dishes forward! Prepare to be judged by Bub! Leaving our plates on the table provided, we stepped back and waited. Instead of taking the dishes back to the judge this time, we heard him coming out to us. Heavy footfalls thudding louder and louder from behind the curtain, and my heart began to beat fast and hard in my chest as I felt an impending sense of doom and dread overcome me. The curtains rippled and ruffled in the wind as if something immense was moving behind them. And then I saw him. Saw... it. The thing which came out from behind the black curtain was huge and dark 
covered in tendrils of smoke and steam, which moved in and out of it and all around it, making it seem not entirely real, and yet flies buzzed around it, swarmed alongside it as if one with the beast. Welcome our famous judge, everybody! Prince of Demons, Lord of the Order of Flies, Bub Belzy. Spielzebub, you twerp. The shadow demon's creature's voice was like broken glass scraping across a chalkboard, like like an avalanche colliding with freight train during a thunderstorm. It felt like like hearing it would make me go deaf. Don't you talk to me like that, I'll tell Dad. You would, little daddy's boy. What? Nothing. Forget it. Let's just eat Susan. She looks delicious. Dan and I stood staring, jaws hanging open, watching as the two demons ate our food. It was obviously what they were, and e even worse, I realized now that we had unwittingly prepared our former co-contestant and, and served her up as burger and stew. Why are you doing this? I screamed at them. It, uh, who would watch this? The host replied with his mouth full while chewing Susan's stew. First of all, everyone in hell loves this show. It is in its 508th season. And answer your first question, why? <laughs> Listen to yourself. We're demons. That's what we do. You know, just try to make the world a little bit more evil. One person at a time. You'll never recover from this. <laughs> and hey, who knows? Maybe you'll infect a few more people with the inevitable darkness that will fester inside you. The shadow monster chuckled under his breath. This burger is delicious, by the way. You win by a long shot. I did a mental fist bump despite the situation. I, I won the competition, e even if it was orchestrated by demons and the mystery box item were human remains. I I'd still won. That's got to be worth something, right? Turns out something was... in my life. The winner of Chopping Block is the only one who was allowed to leave the game show. The runner-up is dismembered and used for the appetizer round the next day. So, what are you going to do with your winnings? The human-looking demon asked as he was letting me out the door. The $10,000 they had given me felt more like blood money now. A bribe. But I didn't want to find out what they would do if I told anyone, so... I thought to keep my mouth shut. Um... I'm, I'm not sure, I said, stepping out into the sidewalk. Maybe I'll open a restaurant. A burger place. I've always been really good at making burgers. You definitely should, Bob. If you do, I'll stop by. That's for damn sure. I turned around and started to walk away. Oh, and, and Bob, he called after me. Y yeah? Don't forget about our Tournament of Champions next month. Can't wait to see what you come up with for that. You're going to have way stiffer competition next time, though. Good luck. He slammed the door shut and left me standing in the street, stunned and terrified. I, I would have to do it all over again next month. Anybody have any good recipes? Daddy, look, I drew a picture. I put on my best appraising my son's artwork face and looked down at the picture he had drawn. I recoiled a little when I saw it, not really sure what to make of it. It was... It, it was a baby head, like a like a baby doll, but no body was attached to it. The hair was gone, nothing but dots on the scalp, and the eyes were missing, staring openly. A big silver loop, like a smile, ran through the head, and the bottom was covered with little metal legs, like, like spider legs. I looked at it a moment, wondering what this horrible thing was, but suddenly it came to me. I felt silly for being anxious. Good job, buddy. Is this the, uh, this is Spider Baby from Toy Story? Handing it back to him. No, Dad. It's the monster that comes to my window at night. 
I sighed audibly. The monster had become a point of contention in our house as of late. Every night for the past three weeks, my son had woken up screaming because there was a monster outside his window. Ever since we had moved into our new house, it had been a regular nightly event, and I had almost started waking up before the screaming. It never mattered how fast I ran. There was never anything there when I arrived. He was always sitting up in his bed, pointing out the window, crying about a, a monster looking in at him. When we got home, he grabbed his tablet and began watching Mickey Mouse Clubhouse, as he would want to do after school. I made sure that he was comfortable on the couch and not likely to run out of the front door and started washing dishes. Between the three of us, we usually made a fair amount of dishes. So I was just finishing up when my wife came home, grimacing at the picture on the fridge as she came in. That's an interesting piece of work, she said, kissing me on the cheek. Apparently that's the monster that's been waking him up every night, I said, making her frown as she sat at the table. Ugh, it's the monster again? This has got to stop. We have to do something. I shrugged, tossing the drying rag into the sink. I wish I knew what. What if you spent the night in there tonight? I looked dubiously at her. What? Like, on the floor or something? No, you could sleep on the other bed in there. I forgot there was two beds in my son's room. They were bunk beds. One on the ground level, one on the top. One was supposed to be for guests, the playmates or cousins who wanted to spend the night. The other was for him. And in reality, though, it was more of an excuse for my son to pick a bed to sleep in every night. He usually slept on the top bunk, sitting right beneath the window. But sometimes he likes to sleep in the smaller bed at floor level. Okay. I guess I'll spend the night in there. Promise you'll reward me in the morning? I teased. She said she would, and giggled when I kissed her on the ear. The reward would never come, though. That night, we went through our nightly routine. After dinner, we brushed our teeth, put on our pajamas, and got ready for bed. As I picked up the book and directed him to the loft bed, though, he grabbed my arm and shook his head. I thought he would argue about bedtime, and... I mean, he wasn't a big one for bedtime. Instead, he just shook his head and pointed to the bottom bunk. Can I sleep there? He asked, pointing to the bottom bunk. I sighed and looked up at the top bunk, wondering how I would get up that tiny little staircase. One look at my son showed me something serious was going on. He looked scared. Too scared for a kid his age, and I was suddenly kind of scared myself. What was so scary about this bed? This wasn't the first time he'd balked at the idea of sleeping on the loft bed. I was kind of hesitant to climb in it. I got over this quickly and told him that he could sleep at the bottom bed if he wanted. So we read our Clifford book, and I turned off the lights, swinging up into the top bunk as I snuggled down to sleep. For a few hours, I slept fitfully. I was awakened in the dark of night by a light scratching at the window. It wasn't a loud scratching. It was soft, like something rubbing lightly against the glass as it attempted to get my attention. Maybe a fingernail, maybe a knife tip, but it was consistent in its effort as it rubbed. After the picture earlier, my tired mind conjured an image of a baby head with a metal spider leg scratching at the glass. In my dream, it dug perfect grooves into the glass like a jewel thief's tool in a movie. And it was making progress through the window. The baby's head had a mouth full of metal teeth to go along with its legs. The teeth gnashed at the glass as the legs cut. I could do little else but lay there and watch him cut through the transparent barrier. I woke up as he scuttled in and leapt at my face, its twisting metal teeth twinkling. When I woke up, I thought the dream hadn't quite ended. The scraping continued. That soft whispery sound, and I opened my eyes and glanced at the window. I was covered, a pillow over my head, and my eyes peeked from beneath a corner of the blanket. I was still half asleep, and as the crust broke away from my eyes, I thought I might still be dreaming. I saw the baby head, middle legs still scrabbling, pressing against the window. I lay still watching the little creature bounce off the glass 
Its scalp was a stubby patch of yanked out hair. Its blue eye looked straight ahead placidly, while the other yawned vacantly. The metal legs were bumping and rubbing, making scratching sounds against the glass. They didn't seem as dexterous as they were in my dream. The monstrous thing seemed like a Halloween decoration, something blown out by the wind as it swung from a post. And as I watched it shake and spasm, I noticed the ring. The ring from the picture, a thick metal loop, ran through the head and connected it to a thick chain. I looked, following the chain, and the outline of a person began to come into view. He was framed perfectly against the privacy bushes in front of my windows, his clothes blending seamlessly. He was tall, six feet at least, and his body was large and looked strong beneath his sweater. His face was doughy and pockmarked as it pressed against the window glass, his tongue wet and forming bubbles as it slid over the filthy glass. His flesh was pressed to the window as he looked into the shady room, and his eyes searched for something. Thankfully, my son probably never saw him, and had only ever seen the strange baby head necklace. If he had seen this strange face pressed against the window, he would have likely never slept in his bed again. The man's eyes found mine suddenly. His crazed look sobering a little as he realized I was not my son. We locked eyes and... And uh, I'm ashamed to say that I did not deliver some piercing look that scared him away. I was, I was just as scared as my son was every night before he had started screaming in my dazed and fearful state. We stared at each other for... A count of five before he broke and ran off into the night. The police just left, taking a complete statement and checking the bushes for evidence. My son is asleep in my bed, my wife having wrapped him in her protective arms, and I'm sitting on the edge, setting this to words. Tomorrow I'm going to the hardware store. I'm going to be coming back with wood to board up the window. I don't care if this weirdo ever comes back or not. Before I let my son spend the night in that room again, I will make sure no one can ever peek through that window again. When my son called me over to his house last Sunday, I thought it was some kind of emergency. His wife is 35 weeks pregnant, and my wife and I have been sitting by the phone waiting for the news that they were rushing to the hospital. I mean, maybe it's a slight exaggeration, but you get my drift, right? We were excited to become grandparents, so I didn't even expect him to surprise me with an early birthday gift. What's this? I asked as he passed me the small envelope. My birthday wasn't for another week or so, to be honest. I was, I was thinking that it had to be a simple gift card or maybe just cash. I, mean, I wasn't expecting anything major. Instead, when I opened up the birthday message, I found two tickets to a local airfield inside. I was both shocked and confused. No, serious, Trevor, what is this? I said with a nervous laugh. You've always been talking about having a little adventure living on the edge, Dad. And, well, you aren't getting any younger, he said, slipping his hand into his pocket. His wife nudged him a little and remarked, What he means is that he hoped that you could do this together before the baby comes. I have to admit. I was speechless. He, he was he was right, though. As, I, as he grew up, I've always been a bit wistful about the things that I've missed out on. Now, I've never been upset about raising a family or anything like that. I mean, of course, I've, I've made sure to let my children know that. But I guess he must have caught on to the subtle hints that I was giving for the past year that I wanted to do something extraordinary. In my dreams, it had always been mountain climbing, snowboarding, something like that. What he was offering was definitely unexpected. So we'll head out to the airfield around dawn, just as the clouds are breaking. I, I got in touch with Pete from, from college. He's got a pilot license, and he can take us up as high as we want for the jump, Trevor said with a broad smile. It sounded frightening. I mean, I've, I've never even been in a plane, and now my son was telling me he wanted me to jump from one. But I, I didn't want to be rude. So I hugged him, and I said thanks. <laughs> and over the next week, I'll admit I did my best to come up with an excuse to why I couldn't go. 
But I googled it online, and I realized not only were these tickets expensive, they... They weren't refundable. It's perfectly safe. People do it all the time, my wife told me when I explained my concern to her. I'm sure Trevor won't just have you going solo. You'll be fine, she added. I tried to push aside my doubts and worries to have a good time. And convincing myself this was just a, a once-in-a-lifetime chance to really live a little. You know, I kept checking the weather, too, thinking maybe divine intervention would prevent me from going. One time, Trevor caught me doing it and reassured me. Don't worry, Dad. Pete said, even if there's a little storm, he can fly us up. It'll be fine. I smiled nervously. He had no idea how scared I was. The night before the skydive, I was in the bathroom, either vomiting or, well, having my dinner come out the other end. And anyway, it was nerves and stress getting the better of me. My damn mind wouldn't calm down about something that was supposed to be fun. Finally, I just had to psych myself up to overcome that initial fear and then took a few pills for anxiety just in case. He picked me up that morning around 6 a.m., right before the sun was rising. I finished getting dressed and checking the sky, noting a few dark clouds to the west. No need to worry, Dad, that's headed the other way out of the area, he said as we climbed into his Jeep Cherokee. The airfield was only about a 20-minute drive from my house, and the whole way I had to give myself another motivational talk in my head. Dad, you look like you've seen a ghost, Trevor teased. Sorry, uh, would you believe your old man is actually scared to death about this? I said with a half-smile. It gave me the stink eye. For the past few years, you've been constantly talking about doing something like this. I mean, don't get cold feet now, he told me. I nodded. I apologized as our instructor showed up, waving excitedly at both of us. Howdy, Trevor. Bruce, glad you both could make it. Perfect day for diving, I do say so myself, he said, walking straight over to the open hangar bay. There weren't many planes available, but it was easy to guess the large cargo vessel was going to be our means to get up into the clouds since it had wide doors on the side. I'm gonna do a pre-flight check. You two just sit right, Pete told us with a wink. I swallowed a gulp of air. Trevor tapped his foot impatiently. Somewhere off in the distance, I heard the rumble of thunder, and I, I reached to check my phone. Oh yeah, I guess I should have mentioned this. No electronic devices should be used during the flight or the jump. People usually drop them by accident, and then it's bye-bye smartphone. So just drop them over here before we take off, Pete said, pointing to the nearby basket. Trevor complied immediately, and I checked the weather again, just to be sure the storm really was moving away. Then again, I thought to myself, I doubted Pete would even come out here if he thought that it was a safety risk. Looks like we're good to go, Pete asked as he climbed on board and started up the instruments for the control panel. The propeller started to spin, and Pete explained what was going to happen. Once I get this engine rev, we're going to be going about 13,000 feet in the next 19 minutes. In the meantime, I'm going to go over a bit of basic parachute safety, he shouted over the roar of the engine. Trevor and I both did our best to listen as he piloted us higher and higher. The altitude and the velocity that we were traveling was enough to make my stomach do some tricks. It was making it difficult to focus on what he was telling us. Then, as we broke the first layer of clouds, Pete got silent as he looked towards the open sky. Uh, some, something wrong? I asked. He had just been explaining how to put on the safety vest when he got dead quiet and remarked, It's just kind of weird. Uh, looks like we got a storm cell in the area. I'll try to fly us a little south. I looked out the window next to my seat and got a good look at the patch of clouds that had him concerned, realizing I had never seen a storm from this angle. Above the clouds, watching moisture gently rise and swirl and form a cluster was both beautiful and astonishing. I'm not an expert on this, but it did seem to move a lot faster than I thought a normal pitch of clouds would. Is 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 that uh is is that storm following us? I asked hesitantly. Saying it out loud sounded bizarre. I was being irrational, I told myself, but neither Trevor or Pete said a word as we flew towards the lower atmosphere to prepare for the jump. We need to dive a little early just to be safe. Pete told us as he repeated some of the instructions for the parachute. Then we heard a loud crack of thunder and the plane itself shook. Maybe we should just turn back, my son remarked. I felt like I was going to throw up after that last tumble in the air, but I told myself I could make it. L let's do this. I'll, I'll be okay, I reassured him. 
Pete got us to a steady altitude and checked the cloud cover. For the moment, everything seemed clear. This is a good spot as any, he told us. Then we saw that some dark storm cell pushed through the cloud cover, swirling like a hive of bees towards us, and I felt my heart drop. It seemed like the cloud was observing us the way a stalking predator would. Then, before I could even ask my son what he thought, a long streak of lightning ripped across the sky and smashed into the cockpit of the plane. Holy shit, Pete said, grabbing a hold of the controls to keep us level. What was that? I asked. Pete jerked the controls of the small aircraft up, forcing me to grab a hold of my seat as I felt my lunch go to the bottom of my stomach. Then we whirled back around and went northwest, shouting, We got something on our tail! I don't know what, but it's nasty! Trevor and I looked towards the way that we had come, both of us speechless with panic as we saw the strange large mass of clouds push towards us. The predator was on the hunt. Do you have a parachute ready? Pete shouted. Another bolt of lightning struck the right wing, smashing apart a third of the plating as we struggled to stay airborne. You need to jump now, Pete instructed. I looked at Trevor for confirmation as more of the strange energy rocketed towards our tiny craft and the plane started to experience power failure. <laughs> Come on, Dad, he shouted as he opened the cargo doors and stared down at the seemingly infinite gap between us and the ground. Dive! Go! Pete insisted as the black storm cloud was about to swarm us all. Trevor leapt first, his body immediately getting caught in the winds of the cloud and falling away from the plane to the east. I held onto the side of the plane, my pulse racing as I looked to Pete. He opened his mouth to give me another command, but never got the chance. Another large bolt of lightning pierced the cockpit and ripped him from his seat. His screams echoed across the expanse for miles as I put one foot on the edge towards the jump. It was now or never. I closed my eyes and plummeted. Immediately, it felt like all the oxygen had left my lungs as I fell and tumbled end over end from the plane. In one flash of my view, I saw the black cloud swarm our ship, tearing it apart the way termites would. It couldn't possibly be another storm cell, I thought to myself. This was a breathing organism, commanding the elements to consume us as food. Then I was hurtling towards the ground, my entire life flashing before my eyes as I searched the wide sky for any sign of Trevor. I saw him, arms outstretched about five yards away, using the specialized suit he was wearing to ride the air down and encouraging me to do the same. I was trying not to think of what had just happened to Pete, to focus on, on everything that we would need to do to make it to the ground and survive. Don't pull the chute until I tell you when, Trevor shouted above the roar of the wind. My brain was still trying to catch up with the decision to even make the jump from the plane when I heard a loud explosion above, and Trevor said, Don't look up! The wind was hitting me as my body got closer and closer to the point of no return. Then the drowning noise from the rushing air was overwhelming by the sound of the storm. Now, Dad, do it now! My son shouted as he reached for his pull string and got ready to launch for the parachute. Then the swarm of dark clouds was already on top of him. As he hit the pull cord, his body shot upwards. I looked up, watching as Trevor disappeared from my sight and holding on to the hope that he was, that he was fine. <laughs> And then the screams came. I couldn't even imagine what was happening to my son as I heard his bones break and his cries for help get louder and louder. I knew if I pulled the cord now, I would be caught in the maw of the bizarre creature too, so I hesitated for one more moment before I yanked on the release. It felt like I was flying for a moment. The sudden exhilaration of moving downwards stopped by the chute opening as I drifted and swayed towards the south. I caught a glimpse of the strange black cloud that had devoured Pete and my son and I... I saw it was about to start following me. I, I panicked. I, I tugged my body towards the tree line, hoping to hide in the canopy and let the monster get tired of searching for me. My parachute snagged the tops of the trees and I was thrown about like a puppet dangling from a string. Above me, I watched the dark cloud of life fly over top of the trees, perhaps, perhaps trying to find its next meal. And then, then it disappeared up through the cloud cover out of sight. I don't know, I'm, not, I'm not really sure how long I was stranded there. Felt like days. I was too terrified to move, too numb with pain from the shocking fall to consider climbing out. With no cell phone to call for help, I was stuck there for the next few hours until some local campers caught sight of me dangling and then helped me down. They offered me warm food and something to drink as I asked for a phone to call my wife. It didn't really hit me 
the Trevor was gone until I, I had to tell her. Tears burst out of my eyes as I, I passed the phone back. I just... I just couldn't stop sobbing from the ordeal I had gone through. The campers took me to a nearby emergency center to get checked for injuries, and the authorities promised that they would find Trevor's body wherever it fell. I, I didn't bother telling them they won't find it. I knew the sound I heard, like a, like, like a python crushing its food. My son was gone. Something in the sky had killed him. It's been about a week now since it happened and my family's still recovering from the loss. None of them know what really happened. All they think I'm experiencing now is just stress, trauma from the event, which is probably, probably partially true. But I, I can't look up at the sky and feel safe anymore. I can't hold back the truth much longer, even though I know they'll call me insane, but they, they need to know. Everyone does. Something unholy and evil is up there in the clouds. We're waiting to kill us all. I pushed the sign deep into the ground and looked at the kids gathering up the street thinly veiled satisfaction. Keep off the dirt. I had seen the way their eyes gleamed when the truck had come over to deliver it and decided on a preemptive strike. A tall pile of fill dirt was irresistible for a small child, and I needed as much of this dirt for my project as possible. Having it scattered all over the yard would make that... difficult. And I needed to post signs before the neighborhood rowdies got any ideas. I went back inside then, not wanting to field questions about my dirt. Sitting in my easy chair, pretending to watch TV, I could see them gathering around to look at the sign. They hunkered over the handlebars at the ten speeds and looked dubiously at the sign I had sunk in the mountain of dirt in the front yard. The sign was pretty straightforward, but I wouldn't put it past these kids to find a loophole. They knew me as the cool neighbor. The single guy who gave out full-size candy bars on Halloween and sometimes played baseball in the street with them. The guy who drank on his front porch and sometimes let them fish in my canal, if, if it was okay with their parents. On some things, however, they knew that I was unbending and that it wouldn't do to argue. They all looked up when I came out of the front porch to lean against the rail and look at them. If you're hoping to find a play in the dirt free card somewhere on top of that pile, it ain't happening. Reggie looked up. His face was still hopeful. Gee, Mr. McIntyre, that sure is a great looking pile of dirt you have there. I nodded, keeping my face neutral as I tried not to smile. Sure is. And it's for filling in gopher holes, so I'll likely need all of it. If there are any left, though, I'll be sure to let you kids know so you can trample it flat for me. They rode off down the road, sitting a little higher on their bikes as they realized they might still have hope. I shook my head as I watched them leave. I never knew anyone to get as excited about a pile of dirt as a bunch of kids. Something about all that fresh, powdery dirt just made them a little crazy. As I looked at the six-foot mound of the white dirt, I almost felt like jumping in it myself. I went inside to finish my preparations getting work clothes on and finding my gloves. I sat in the living room, pulling my boots on when I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I glanced up, the afternoon shadows just starting the lightning, and saw a pair of small figures standing beside the road. I paused in mid-tie, looking up to see the two small forms looking at the pile of dirt. It looked to be a couple of neighborhood kids, maybe having one last look before going back. I shook my head. Kids are so predictable. I finished tying my boots and stepped out on the front porch. Looking is fine. I don't want to see any of my... The road is empty. I looked up and down the road. The kids were already playing a game of touch football further down the cul-de-sac, and I picked up my shovel as I thought about how strange that had been. 
Those two must have really been booking it to make it back to their playmates that quickly. As I started scooping dirt, I thought longingly about having that kind of energy. It would make my job easier. I spent the rest of the afternoon filling in gopher holes. It had been a particularly bad season for them, and the dirt was a band-aid solution at best. The gophers would continue to dig up my yard until I invested in a dog or something. I kept slinging dirt until the sun grew low in the sky. One angry chuck actually came up to growl at me before I threw a shovel full of dirt on him. Then it became too dark to see. I thrust my shovel into the dirt pile, shook the remaining dirt off myself. The kids were finishing up their football game, heading home as the streetlights came on. They all looked longingly at the dirt pile, but they knew better than to make a play for it while I was still standing on my front porch. My cigarette winked on and off as I stood watching the sun go down, and I pitched the end of the dirt as I went inside. I was frying up some hamburgers when I heard the first tremor of laughter from the front yard. Over the sound of popping grease, I could hear the scuttling laughter of children as they played out front. I walked over to the living room window and looked out into the front yard. By the streetlight's ghostly light, I could see them playing in the mound of dirt I had out front. There were two of them, both dressed in dirty jeans and colorful shirts, and both having a ball as they capered on the dirt pile. I was out the door in a matter of seconds, yelling before the door had fully opened. Hey, just what the hell do you think you're doing? Can't you read? Stay off! The streetlights were dim. But even I could see an absence of people in my yard. I walked over to the pile, looking around to see if anyone was hiding behind it. I saw pretty quickly that this wasn't going to be the case. The dirt pile was hardly three feet tall, and a kid would have to get pretty low to hide in it. I glanced up and down the street, but the only thing moving on the road was an old chip bag pushed by the wind. I looked back at the pile and was shocked to find that I didn't even see any footprints. The wide, low dirt pile stood looking fairly pristine, other than the shovel marks. I scratched my head, sure of what I had seen, but I went, I went back inside anyway. Maybe he had just been working too hard. I pulled my fries out of the oven just as they started to burn. I made two hamburgers and added them to the pile of french fries. I dipped a beer into a chilled glass and brought both to the table. After an afternoon spent shoveling dirt, I was tired and I was ready for a bite. And as I lifted the first one from the plate, I heard my stomach grumble as the grease oozed off the meat. I had just taken the first bite when I heard the metal clanging of my shovel falling over. I looked up to find those kids playing on my dirt pile again. I came barreling out the door, my dinner cooling on my plate as I stomped out to send those kids off. I was becoming frustrated. I, I had made it pretty clear that I didn't want people on my dirt pile. I'd been pretty nice about it. I, I, I was posting signs and asking the kids not to mess with it, but it appeared that some of these kids just weren't getting it. If I needed to be a bastard to keep these kids off my dirt, I supposed I'd have to be a bastard. I barely gotten two words out of my mouth before I once again noticed that the yard was empty. I, I was really getting tired of this. I, I know what I saw. And what I saw was the same pair of filthy kids on my pile of dirt. No matter how many times I checked that yard, however, there was never... Never any sign of trespassers. The, strange, the strangest part was the lack of footprints. I mean, the sand was fresh. Maybe even a little damp. When you go past the top layer, the kids had been jumping on the sand like a trampoline. There, there must have been footprints, handprints, something. They came back three more times that night. The last is the only one that really stands out. That was the worst of their appearances. They appeared again as I finished my dishes, and again as I sat watching TV. I came striding out to holler at them both times, but I found an empty yard both times. This was this was ridiculous. The hell was going on? I know what I saw, but they were always gone the instant I came outside. Nobody could move that fast, especially not a bunch of dirty little kids. What the hell were they doing out after dark? Most of the parents on the block didn't let their kids out after the streetlights came on. Something funny was going on here. The last time I saw them, that night at least, it was just before bedtime. I thought the pranks were over as the time slipped on. It was 11 o'clock and I was walking through the living room to get something to help me sleep. I was still a little on edge and I thought that a nightcap might help me calm down a bit. I was coming out of the kitchen with my tumbler of whiskey. The curtain still opened on the front yard when I saw him there. 
My glass slipped out of my hand as the two kids stood crouched on top of my dirt pile. I was speechless for a moment as the angry fire built inside of me. I was... I mean, I was furious. Who the hell did these kids think they were? They came storming out in the middle of the night trying to mess with me, but why? Meanwhile, I had made a very simple request. Why? Why were the kids tormenting me? Because I wouldn't let them play in the dirt pile? If I had stopped to quell my anger, I might have noticed that something wasn't right with these two. The night air was cool on my bare chest as I came shambling out of my house like an angry bull. Who the hell do you think you are? It's almost midnight. Get your asses over here now. I want to call your parents and let them know where you've been. And you know, I've got a good mind to... They hadn't moved this time, though. They just stood on that mound of the dirt like two scrawny scarecrows, glowering at me with dirt-caked faces. Oh my God, they, they've been eating the dirt or something? They, they had... I mean, I had thought them filthy, but these kids were downright grimy. They didn't seem at all concerned with me, but I, I, I definitely had their full attention. I had come half into the yard when I saw their eyes. They... They both seemed to have a nasty case of red eye. They stared at me, their eyes seeming to glow somehow. I, I suddenly noticed that they they cast no shadows in the dim streetlights. They should have. The dirt pile on my shovel cast a long shadow in the failing light, but these two had nothing. I had stopped now, barely 20 feet from the pair, when the larger of the two took a step towards me. When his dirty sneaker gritted against the loose earth, the red piping faded beneath all the mud. I saw the earth draw up over it like a hand. He opened his mouth trying to say something, but all that came out was a it was wet soil, sand, and mud bubbling over his lips, and the dirt that had covered his foot had begun to slide up his leg as well. The other fell to his knees, clutching his throat as he coughed up leaves and mud. The sand slid over his hands and his arms even as the dirt bound the first boy to the pile by his knees they both struggled trying to free themselves from the prison of the sand but their efforts were ultimately in vain the sand reclaimed them both in a sudden whoosh and in a blink they were both they were both gone again i walked backwards never taking my eyes off the pile until the door was closed between us the next day i set to work early I wanted that pile of dirt out of my yard before nightfall. I worked diligently, filling in holes, putting the pile to good use. I used it to fill in a few of the potholes in front of my house, even. I just wanted as much of it gone as I could manage. I no longer cared about how it happened. When the kids came by on their bikes, I told them to leave. I mean, they seemed disappointed, but I, I didn't want them anywhere near this dirt pile. I was filling in an exceptionally large gopher hole when something caught my eye. I nearly turned back to the pile when something pale and long made me take a, a second look. At first I thought it might have been a worm, but the more I looked, the more I thought I... I knew what I saw. I bent down, the, the shovel hitting the ground woodenly as I reached down to pick up what I hoped was a bleached piece of wood. It wasn't, it wasn't, it was, it was cold, malleable if not unmovable and crooked like a sea of pale, purpling flesh. The perfectly filthy nail was hardly visible at the top of the small finger. I went back to the pile and saw the rest of the hand poking out from the bottom, minus the finger I had accidentally severed. The cops came when I called, and they, they brought dogs with them as well as a big white forensics van. They excavated the body of a ten-year-old boy, from the bottom of the dirt pile, his face, his face frozen in a look of terrified disbelief. He was dressed in very dirty, if, if not familiar, clothes, and his sneakers had the same filthy red piping that I had seen the night before. When they lifted him free, they found his other hand intertwined with something, and as he came free, so too did another hand. The other boy had been about eight. The two had died hand in hand. The police had wanted to arrest me, or at least bring me in for questioning, but the forensics guy figured out pretty quick these kids had been dead for at least a month. A quick search determined that they had been on the missing persons roster for about three weeks. Their parents had feared that they had been abducted by some... some pervert. They had been playing near the sand pit before they had gone missing, and 
The coroner would later find dirt and mud in their lungs and their mouths. He figured they'd been climbing on the big sand piles they have out here. And piles are just waiting to be scooped into a truck and, and sold as fill dirt. And one of them had been sucked down by a pocket of air or an or empty spot in the pile. His brother must have tried to help him up and ended up getting pulled down as well. And two had suffocated as they, as they, as they tried to get out. They'd been picked up with the fill dirt as they trucked it over to the company. The one that I bought it from. It happened sometimes, Coroner had told me. When I asked about it a few weeks later. Kids never think about that kind of thing. They just see a big pile of dirt and they start climbing. I, um... I haven't seen the two since they took the bodies away, and the company I, I bought it from came and they got the rest of the dirt after they um, gave me a full refund. I uh, I hope they find peace wherever they are now. I think from now on, I'll just hire someone to fill in the holes in my yard. I don't ever want to see another pile of dirt for as long as I live. Jacob Masterson sat in the wilderness, listening for the small, quiet voice of his God. For three days, he had knelt, a Bible clasped in his right hand, his pistols piled up before him. He was close to the edge now, his body a dried-out husk, yet still Still, he would not drink. If this was his time, then he would die here, waiting for the word. Another day and night passed, and still he would not move, even when the storm hit, and wind walked and talked all about him like a living thing. Why was he here? Was it a penance for Jericho? Was it the voice of God he was waiting for, or that of the devil? Finally, with a groan, he slumped over before falling on his back, his hazy blue eyes blinded by the desert sun. North, the wind whispered. Go north. Thy will shall be done, Jacob groaned as he crawled like a broken snake towards his waiting supplies. God was wrathful and all atoned in the end. Jericho. Jacob whispered as the cold water burned his lips. Damn it, Jericho. Three days before, Jacob had stood upon a hill looking down at a small cattle town. The sun at his back and his poor, tired horse beneath him. He had ridden the mare hard for a full day and night. Now he was here, looking for a man. Not just any man, but a killer. A murderer of innocent women and children. That's what Jacob did. That's how he served God. He hunted down the evil of this world and brought it to justice. Sometimes it was men. Sometimes more than men. Long ago, he had been a preacher, and in some ways, he still was. His chapel was the desert and lonely places. The coyotes and wolves, his flock. He dwelt in the badlands and border towns, listening, always listening for the word. Sometimes it came on the winds, sometimes in his fevered dreams, but it always came. And Jacob followed. Get on, Jacob urged the mare forward, not liking the look of this place. One half the town was in complete darkness, the other lit up like a Christmas tree. It was quiet, too. No cows snorted or stamped their feet. Not a single cricket chirped with the setting sun. And most unnerving of all, not a single sound of human habitation could be heard. No raised voices or body singing coming from the local saloon. No laughing children or giggling wives. Nothing. Oh, he said, pulling up outside a swinging sign. Jericho, the sign read. 
Check your guns at the city limit. Fat chance, Jacob said, clambering from his saddle to tie the mare to a nearby hitching post before he retrieved his rifle. He was just about to enter the town when a heavy hand fell upon his shoulder. Jacob dropped his rifle and span about, drawing his six-shooter in one fluid motion. The man before him didn't move. He didn't even flinch. Now, who the hell are you? Jacob asked, taking in the man's rough-looking appearance and straggly beard. Best not to go in there, the stranger said, nodding his shaggy head towards the darkened tower. Why is that? Jacob asked, sliding his finger from around the trigger. Not here, the man said, heading into the darkness. I have a camp up in the hill not too far. We can break bread and talk a little. All right, Jacob said, holstering his gun and retrieving his rifle before falling in beside the stranger. I'm Jacob. You have a name? Ben. Ben. But you can call me Bear, the stranger replied. Oh yeah, and why they call you that? The man shrugged. Some say I have the strength of ten bears. Well, you sure are big enough, Jacob said, taking in the man's huge shoulders and deep chest. Again, the man shrugged. There are many kinds of strength. Yeah, Jacob replied, glancing over his shoulder at the receding town. Yeah, there are. Twenty minutes later, the two men were sat in a smoke-filled tent, a roaring fire between them. The nights were getting colder now, and Jacob was happy for the fire's warmth. I'm looking for a man, Jacob began, but the stranger waved that away and handed Jacob a slab of bread and some dried meat. It is customary to eat first before discussing matters of a serious nature. Jacob nodded and accepted the offered food before bowing his head and saying grace. Ben also took up the prayer, his deep voice making it sound almost musical. When the prayer was finished, Jacob raised his head. You're a Christian? he asked. I have been from time to time. Fair enough, Jacob said, finishing his meal and taking a small flask of whiskey from inside his duster. Have a drink? He offered the flask, but the man only drank sparingly before handing it back. Jacob smiled and took a long, hard pull the fiery liquid warming him all the way down to his boots before lighting up a smoke. You said it was best not to go into town, but I have been told there is a man in Jericho that needs some killing, and I mean to do it. If the man you seek is in Jericho, then that man is dead, or worse. Not many things are worse than death, Jacob said crushing out his smoke. Although I have seen such states from time to time. The stranger nodded his head. Yes. You have the look of a man that has rode hard and seen much. That's why I want you to help me destroy this evil. What evil are we talking about? Jacob asked. Ben did not answer immediately. You said you've seen a few things worse than death. What are these things you've seen? Jacob knew the man had something that he wanted to tell him, but thought that he would have trouble believing it, so Jacob dove right in. If the man thought him mad, Jacob would leave him to his business and go on his way. I've seen many things while serving the Lord. At first, it was just the plain old evil that lives in the hearts of men. Murderers, rapists, thieves. When a man needs killing, the Lord sent me on my way, but... There have been times when the Lord has sent me up against things that was that was not men. Ben leaned eagerly forward. Tell me of these things that have put such a look in your eyes. I've seen men, men that can turn themselves into great beasts, dead men who stalk the night, feeding off the living in New Mexico. I killed a bruja. Cursed her village. She was sacrificing a babe on the altar when I gunned her down, but even then she wouldn't lay still until I stuffed a few pages of the good book into her screaming mouth. Took her head. After I'd finished, the villagers threw her body into a river. Said it was the only way to keep her spirit from returning. And you've killed many of these creatures. 
A goodly few, but thankfully, they're far and few between. You must love your God very much to perform such miracles in his name. Nope, Jacob replied. He's cold and cruel and wrathful. Even when his own son was dying, he wouldn't take the cup from his lips. So what chance does Jacob Marston have? I follow him because he demands it of me. But I don't much like it. For a moment, the big man seemed to reflect on this. Yes. God can be cruel, he said. Was it God that sent you here? No, the big man replied before reaching behind him and pulling out a small leather bag, which he tossed to Jacob's feet. It was death. Immediately, something in the bag began to twist and turn. What is it? Something of the evil of which you speak, the big man sighed. Jacob eyed the bag wryly before quickly scooping it up. Instantly, a feeling of revulsion like nothing he had ever felt before shot through his body, and with a cry, he threw it down, emptying the contents onto the hard-packed floor. It was a hand, but not like anything Jacob had ever seen before. He was huge, spade-like, covered in black scales. The multi-jointed fingers tipped with razor-like claws. What is it? Jacob asked, never taking his eyes from the now crawling monstrosity. I am not sure. It shifts and changes, Ben replied, grabbing up the claw, which convulsed, grasping at his wrist. With a curse, he wrenched it free and stuffed it back into the sack. See how it twists and turns. It knows its master is near. I used it to track the beast here to this place. I believe it is some kind of shapeshifter. And what happened to you? Jacob asked, crushing out his smoke. You were attacked, weren't you? By this beast, the shapeshifter. How did you survive? I fled, Ben said, looking Jacob straight in the eye. My courage gave out and I ran like a coward into the forest while that thing attacked our camp. There were maybe thirty of us. A small logging camp to be sure, a few strong men their families, desperate to make a few dollars off the land. But then this stranger arrived. We took him in, and he repaid us with murder and madness. So you fled. And then how is it you possess this creature's hand? I returned, of course, Ben replied, straightening his shoulders. I prayed all through the long night. The screams of the dying and the creatures, terrible laughter and howling, echoed through the dark. That's when I heard a voice telling me to return to end this madness, and so I did. How to describe the things I saw that night as I emerged from the forest? The whole camp was ablaze, lighting up the night sky. There were pots and pans strewn about the blood-soaked earth. Bones and chunks of flesh lay scattered all about, and, and there, dancing amongst the flames, that creature, laughing, gibbering, covered in blood of my loved ones. A madness came over me, and I charged the beast, axe raised as I leapt to the flames. The thing spun around, but it was too late. I was already upon the beast, slashing at its loathsome flesh. Screeching, it raised a clawed hand to protect its scabrous head, but I lopped it off. Hot black blood sprayed across my face, driving me on to greater madness. Eventually, my wild swings backed the creature up against a tree. I raised my arms for the killing blow when the creature's face began to ripple and change. My own wife's face looked up at me great tears and sadness ran down her face. You abandoned us, she sobbed. You ran away, and now we are one with the beast. I knew it for a ruse, but still I... 
I hesitated, and in that split second, the creature fled howling into the night. And you tracked it here using that thing, Jacob said, nodding towards the still squirming sack. Yes, Ben replied. The creature is here in this town, spreading its madness. I've heard screams these past few nights and the sound of gunfire. And you did nothing? No, he said, settling down by the fire. I was waiting. For you. The next morning, the two men set out. Jacob cleaned and blessed his pistols, reciting the Lord's Prayer over them again and again, splashing the gleaming metal with blessed water. He also carried a rifle across his back and a small black Bible from which many pages were missing. Ben walked beside him, a large axe in his hand, a huge buck knife hanging at his waist. What should we expect? Jacob said as they approached the outskirts of town. Madness, the big man replied. There is something you should know. This creature, whatever it is, spreads madness and death. When I buried my people back at the camp, I saw signs of mutilation. Self-mutilation. The big man swallowed hard. It's like this thing gets into people's minds and drives them crazy. Jacob drew his pistols. Well, we'd better get to it then. Ben said nothing but trotted to keep up as Jacob lengthened his stride, eager to smite the evil that now haunted this town. They passed a saloon, its dusty bat-winged doors creaking in the growing wind. You know, Jacob said, glancing around, her place of madness and death kind of quiet. You don't think it knows where... But that was as far as he got. Suddenly, there was a scream, and the street began to fill with howling people who flooded like locusts from the nearby houses and buildings, their clothes torn, their chomping jaws bloody and foaming. Jacob's hands began to do their deadly dance, gunning down the screaming mob. By his side, Ben let out a war cry and waded in, cutting down men, children, and women alike. Jacob's smoking guns clicked empty, and with a curse, he backed into the saloon, his nimble fingers ramming gleaming cartridges into the smoking chambers. A man suddenly lunged from behind the bar. Surprise! He screamed through bloody teeth. Fuck you, Jacob replied, smashing a nearby bottle of whiskey across his face. The crowd was nearly upon him now, tearing at his clothes. With a cry, he vaulted the bar and ran across its length, firing into the screeching crowd as he banged through the back door and into the street, praying Ben was still alive. He rounded the corner of the building, one down boot heels kicking up dust. As his fingers automatically rammed more cartridges home, the crowd was thinning now under the onslaught of Jacob's guns. But still, on they came. Praying, Jacob stopped and turned just as a naked fat man rounded the corner, his dick swinging in the wind beneath the belly filled with flesh of his neighbors. Jacob did not hesitate but pulled the trigger, blowing the top of the howling man's head off. A woman was next, her face covered in bite marks, her eyes black and doll-like. Jacob gave her more of the same. Now only a few stragglers remain, an old man waving a cane with bloody teeth, a small child wielding a large butcher's knife and a naked girl, both nipples bitten away and her breasts covered in blood. Jacob gunned them all down without mercy, knowing they were all cursed, possessed by some terrible evil. As Jacob watched on, a final opponent charged, a man dressed in a miner's clothes, wielding a splintered chair leg. The man swung high, but Ben ducked low, slicing his knife across the snarling man's guts. The man carried on, betrayed by his own furious swing, leaving the back of his head exposed. With another maniacal laugh of glee, Ben brought down his axe, whistling into the back of the man's head, ending the fight in a welter of hair and blood. He didn't stop there, but he fell to his knees, arms pistoning up and down as he started to chop the man into tiny pieces. Ben! Jacob cried, wondering if the big man had lost his mind. For the love of God, stop! He's dead! They're all dead! For a moment, he turned and stared at Jacob, his eyes blank. But then he gave himself a shake and his eyes cleared. Yes, he said, taking a shuddering breath. They are, they are all dead. 
but not the creature. We must... We must find it. And perhaps any survivors. Take about it. Survivors. Perhaps, but it is unlikely. No one in my camp survived. Maybe not, Jacob said, holstering his guns. We have to check anyway. Yes, I suppose. There is a church at the end of town. Perhaps some of the townsfolk may have fled there. We should check it out. All right, Jacob said. Lead the way. A few minutes later, they were stood outside a small wooden church, all white boards and peeling paint. The doors were firmly shut, but already Jacob could hear murmurs from within. Okay, Jacob said, turning to the big man, eyeing his blood-soaked muscles. Let me handle this. I'll take one look at you and, and die of fright. You just hang back until I sort out the whole affair. Yes, Ben replied. This is your domain, creature, not mine. Jacob ignored that and hurried up the stairs before banging on the door noisily. Hello inside! Open up! It's safe now! Go away, creature! A wavering voice answered. We know your tricks! We're safe in the house of God! It must have been here, Jacob whispered, but the big man was not listening. He only stared up at the cloud-covered sky as if wishing he was somewhere else. My name is Jacob Marston. I'm a preacher. I've been sent here to help you. Go away, creature, another voice spoke up. You cannot enter the house of God. God damn it, Jacob hissed to himself. They're too goddamn scared to listen to reason. Looks like the hard way, then. Drawing his pistols, he unloaded them into the door. From inside came the screams of women and frightened children as he brought a booted foot down onto the now busted lock and kicked the door wide open. A gunshot rang out and something plucked at his sleeve. But Jacob ignored it and walked inside, ignoring the milling people in the room. He dipped his fingers into a nearby font and made the sign of the cross. He turned back to them, eyeing a man half hidden behind a pew, a shaking rifle in his hand a dirty Roman collar around his neck. You must be the preacher, I reckon, Jacob said, watching the man carefully. Like I said, I am here to help you. You're not that thing, the man replied, lowering his rifle. It can't come in here. It's tried to lure us outside before with empty promises, even mimicking the voices of loved ones, but we all, we all knew it for a lie. Parishioners, yeah. He looked desperately at his parishioners, who nodded their support. How many are you? Uh, just what you see here. Just me, my wife, and Jenny and Joseph from a little ways down the street, and their two boys, Michael and David. The rest of the town went insane, attacking each other, biting and tearing. We all fled into the church and locked ourselves in. And that same night, a thing turned up at the door. At first it threatened us, and then it started to offer us things. I sent the others away so they wouldn't be tempted. What did it offer you? Jacob asked, but the priest only shook his head, his cheeks flushed. It's no matter. Uh, we didn't heed the voice of the devil. That's good. You can't stay here. We need to get you and the children to safety. We can't leave here. The preacher said, shaking his head violently. The townspeople are all dead. My friend and I took care of them. What friend? The priest asked, trying to look around Jacob. Ben, uh, come in here for a moment, Jacob yelled. But there was only the sighing of wind from the outside. Ben, he called again, heading outside, but the big man was gone. Goddamn fool. Might have gone to find the creature. Come on, grab your things. We're heading out. We have a camp nearby in the hills. You should be safe there. I have to hurry back and help my friend. For a moment, the priest seemed torn, but the look on Jacob's face took no argument, and he gathered his people together and hurried outside. As soon as the last person stepped outside, there was a resounding crash as the church doors were slammed shut. 
Jacob turned on his heels, hand dropping towards the butt of his gun, but hesitating when he saw Ben, who stood on the steps, beaming down at him. Ah, oh, Jacob, the big man grinned. What a marvel you are. I've been trying for days to get these little rabbits out of their hole, and you come along so trusting, so forthright, and pop. Out they come. He giggled incessantly, his face growing elongated, his body becoming impossibly thin and scaled. Mother of God! Jacob cursed. Ben! Ben is dead, the creature hissed through crooked teeth. May he burn in hell forever. Look what he did to me. It screeched, holding up its ragged stump of an arm from which black blood still oozed. I was fulfilled. All I wanted to do was go back to sleep in my dark cave and wait for Mother Moon to awaken me once more. But not now. Not when I am not complete. I need these people. It said, hulking forward, I must be restored before the long sleep. So sorry, it chuckled, running a blackened tongue over its drooling lips. God curse, son of a bitch, Jacob growled, slapping leather. He drew his gun, but there was only a dry click. Screeching, the creature leapt forward, barreling into Jacob, sending him crashing to the ground, his pistols flying out into the dust. For a moment, it loomed above him, and Jacob was sure that he was dead, but the creature leapt away, chasing down the fleeing townsfolk who ran in panic-stricken circles. By the time Jacob managed to climb to his feet, it was all over. Blood and body parts lay strewn all about. Only the beast remained, whole and intact once more. Children always taste the best, it said, sucking on its bloody claws, so young, so tender. But Jacob wasn't listening. He was already running, full tilt, back towards the church, his arms pumping, duster coat flapping out behind him. The creature gave a cheating howl and lunged after him. Jacob was almost at the steps when the creature leapt for his unprotected back. Lightning fast, he spun about and dropped on his back, pistoning his legs upward. He caught the creature high in the midriff and, using its own momentum, catapulted it up and forward, straight through the church doors. Instantly, the creature began to scream and wither, thrashing on the floor, smoke streaming from its burning back. Jacob jumped onto his feet and, smiling, paced into the church, his grimy fists clenching and unclenching. Rejoice! He intoned, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Reaching down, he grabbed the screaming creature by the back of its neck, avoiding its swiping claws and dragging it toward a nearby font. I will instruct you and teach you in the ways you should go. I'll counsel you with my eyes upon you, he quoted, smashing the creature's face into the font, submerging its scabrous head into the blessed waters, which instantly began to bubble and steam. The creature went wild with its thrashing. With a curse, Jacob pulled a silvered knife from his belt. It stabbed the creature's side over and over again, drenching himself in its vile blood, its body twisting and turning, but Jacob bared down, pinning the thing in place until at last... Bloody and defeated, it lay still. Jacob released the creature, letting the remains fall to the floor. Requiem aeternum dom est domine et lux, perpetua leteo es, he intoned, making the sign of the cross over the smoking remains before stepping outside into the blazing sunlight. He stayed in Jericho for another two weeks, burying the dead where he could find them, before venturing into the desert. Many had died by his hand, innocent and cursed alike. Now was a time for reflection and atonement, but now that time had finished. He had come out of the desert, weak but cleansed, the voice of God ringing in his ears. North. Go. North. And so he had. Following the Santa Fe Trail from New Mexico, deep into Comanche territory and beyond. 
At first, he slept rough, the smoke from a small campfire bringing on haunting dreams. His days nodding on his saddle, and for a time, he stayed with a wagon train, trading the protection of his guns for food. Another time, he stayed with a group of prospectors who were heading north, the smell of gold dust filling their minds with a strange kind of fever. North. Go north. And so he had. He had followed the Santa Fe Trail from New Mexico deep into the Comanche Territory and beyond. At night he slept rough, the smoke of his small campfire bringing on haunting dreams. His days nodding on his saddle. For a time he stayed with a wagon train, trading the protection of his gun for food. Another time he stayed with a group of prospectors who were also heading north, the smell of gold dust filling their minds with a strange kind of fever. After many months in the saddle, he left the scrub lands and desert behind, entering the lush green flatlands of the Midwest. That night he dreamed of a great lake surrounded by low-lying hills and spruce forest. He woke with a name upon his lips. Hell Creek. It took Jacob another three days to locate the town. He had been directed from a rancher named David Bayon, who he'd met on the road. The man was thin as a weasel, with a rat face to boot, but his disposition was sunny. The two men rode together for a little while until they came to a crossroad. There, the skinny rancher had taken the path bearing to left. He had instructed Jacob to follow the path to the right that came out at the lustrous town of Hell Creek. Jacob had waved the man farewell, and hurriedly followed the path for some miles until at last he crested a small hillock, revealing the town below. From what Jacob could see, the town was aptly named. The town was bisected, almost split in half, by a small river that seemed to run straight through the middle. The side had been shored up with concrete, making a kind of small canal which was spanned by a couple of rickety-looking bridges before it seemingly vanished underground. The town looked like something straight out of a fairy tale, and yet the whole scene made Jacob feel nervous. There was something here, something in the air, a kind of heaviness that made it difficult to breathe, like trying to breathe in a mouthful of syrup. Well, he said to himself, you're not going to find out shit sat here with your thumb up your ass. Get along, horse, he said, nudging the animal forward. But the big mare wouldn't move. Even when Jacob nudged her with his spurs, she wouldn't budge. But grew belligerent, snorting, pawing at the ground. Okay, okay, Jacob said, dismounting and stroking her neck gently. That's a girl, he grinned, taking her by the reins. He gently pulled her forward. At first she resisted, but after some cajoling and more than a little cursing, she reluctantly came along. The first building Jacob came to as he entered the town proper was a jailhouse. A man stood outside, and slender, chugging on a cigar as he watched Jacob approach. Morning, he waved, coming down the stairs and heading straight towards Jacob, who noticed the glittering star upon his chest. Morning, Jacob replied not liking the way the man's eyes roamed over him, lingering on the guns at his hip. Afraid you have to check those shooting irons. Town ordinance, I'm afraid. No firearms inside the city limits. Jacob's eyes stayed on the man's own revolver. The other man followed him, grinning and held out his hand. Sheriff Marty Williams, he laughed. I get to keep mine. <laughs> Perks of the job. Jacob took the offered hand, which was soft and oily. He pumped it once and let it go. Jacob. Name's Jacob Marston. Funny, he said, glancing around at the men passing to and fro. Looks like a lot of these men are breaking the town ordinance. I know them, the sheriff said, his eyes remaining, but his hand had dropped almost casually towards his gun belt. But I don't know you. So give them up, turn yourself around, go find another town to drink at. We ain't much for strangers anyway. Okay, 
Jacob shrugged, unfastening his gun belt and handing it over. I'll take the rifle, too, the sheriff said, nodding towards Jacob's horse. Jacob sauntered over to his mare, grabbed up the rifle and handed it over. Had everything? The sheriff asked. Just my knife. You want that, too? No, you can keep it. You can collect these, he said, hefting Jacob's gun. When you leave, you just stay out of trouble while you're here. It's a good town with good people, quiet place. That's how we like it, you understand? Sure, Jacob replied. All I want is a hot meal and a bath. I won't stay too long. Well, that's just fine. Have yourself a good day, Jacob. There a church in town? No, Sheriff replied over his shoulder. Burned down some years back. And you didn't rebuild it? Jacob called after him. But he was talking to fresh air. The sheriff had already gone, slamming the door behind him. One of the first things Jacob noticed as he crossed the street towards the local hotel and eatery was the women. Not because he hadn't been with one for a while, although he hadn't, but because they all seemed pregnant. Everywhere he looked, there was a round belly, from the earliest teenager girl right up to the woman far past their prime, all seemed to be carrying a heavy load. Well, he thought to himself a little ruefully, probably not much else to do in a little spat shit burg like this. For now, he put it out of his mind. He was hungry and filthy from his long months on the road. But all he wanted now was a hot meal and a warm bath. Later, he would head down the street, see if he could find this ruined church of theirs, and have him a little look around. His bath was like his meal. Warm, barely satisfactory. His room was more of the same. A bed, a dresser, and not much else. Still... It was better than the hard-packed earth and a saddle for a pillow. Unable to resist the pull of sleep, Jacob laid down and was almost instantly asleep. He woke some time later with the setting sun. The noise from the local saloon had become a raucous background noise. Still, he was glad of it. If the bawling singing and drunken laughter had not woken him, he may have easily slept through to morning, and there was still much to do. Like, take a look at this burnt-down church of theirs. Not that there was anything unusual about a burnt-down church. Most of the houses, if not all the town, would be made from lumber. It was the fact that they had not rebuilt their house of worship that troubled Jacob. A church was a meeting place for the community. A beacon of hope in dark times. A place to cleanse the soul and seek forgiveness. Yet the denizens of Hell Creek had left theirs to rot for two years. It smelt wrong to Jacob, and he decided to check it out before he lost too much of the light. Hurrying down the stairs, he headed into the street and across a small wooden bridge to the local saloon. Whiskey had a way of loosening the tongues, and Jacob had many questions. Pushing through the batwing doors, Jacob felt the atmosphere thick with cigar smoke, and the smell of cheap whiskey perfumed the air. For a moment, conversation faltered, and Jacob could feel many eyes upon him as he sauntered across the room to the beer-soaked bar. Coffee, he said to the mustachioed man behind the bar. Uh, we don't sell coffee, stranger, the fat man sneered, wiping his hand on a filthy apron. Only beer or whiskey. We may have a soda pop around here somewhere, if you fancy it. That drew a few laughs from the group of nearby men at the bar, but Jacob ignored them. Whiskey, then. Jacob said, blue eyes drilling into the barman's face. And be quick about it. The barman smiled, wilted under the icy gaze, and he hurriedly poured Jacob's drink, sloshing a goodish amount on the bar before quickly scurrying away. Jacob turned and faced the room, but nobody met his gaze. And soon, the piano player struck up another tune, breaking the ominous silence. Slowly, conversation started back up, and the denizens of the town went back to their drinking and debauchery, leaving Jacob alone to scan the room. He was on his second drink when he noticed the girl in the corner. She was dressed gaily, all feathers and tight corsets, and Jacob guessed correctly that she was one of the whores that worked the establishment, but unlike the other girls who flitted from customer to customer, trying hard to ply their trade, this girl sat alone, looking sullenly like a half-empty glass of beer. Jacob could clearly see the reason why. 
The girl was pretty and had one hell of a scar running from her right eye across the bridge of her nose, petering off down the side of her left cheek. Someone did quite the number on her, Jacob thought, as he approached, trying not to draw too much unwanted attention. Hi, he said, taking a seat beside her in a quiet corner. Name's Jacob. Annabelle, she said, smiling thinly. You too broke to pay for a good whore? Wondering if you can get a discount for this one? She said, gesturing to her face. You do. I don't mind paying the full price. Jacob smiled. I have more than a few scars of my own, and they, they bother me none. The girl smiled to think on this for a while before taking his hand and leading him upstairs to her room. They had barely got through the door when the girl started to strip. Okay, full price is five dollars. You can wash your pecker over there, she said, nodding her head to a wash bowl and jug. How about ten dollars and you get to keep your clothes on? The girl stopped fumbling at her corset and just looked at him. Lord God, what now? What kind of crazy shit you into, mister? Jacob laughed at this and sat down on the bed, hat in hand. No crazy shit. Just a little information's all. The girl laughed, harsh and unpleasant. Damn, mister, I don't know nothing about nothing around here. The simple thing. I just want to know where the local church is, that's all. You're going to pay me $10 and get directions to an old burnt-down church? Yep, Jacob replied. That and your silence. I don't want anyone to know that I'm looking into things. What things? The girl asked nervously, her eyes shifting around the room. There's nothing to look into. Mayhaps there is. Mayhaps there isn't, Jacob said, standing up. But I intend to take me a look anyways. You're an outsider here, like I am. You don't need no scar across your face to tell me that. I haven't been here long. I came looking for my sister. We worked in a cattle town about 30 miles from here. Well, that was before this happened. She gestured to her face. She said I was bringing her down, and so she left heading for Hell's Creek and new clientele. She didn't invite me to come along, so I stayed here in Stetson for a while. I missed her, so I took a stagecoach to town, but by the time I got here, she was already gone. At least, that's what the sheriff said. I was convinced to stay in the end, she said, looking at the floor. Nobody ever leaves here. Not really. What do you mean? What's going on in this place? Keep your ten dollars, the girl said, suddenly standing. St. Mark's, or what's left of it anyway, is at the west end of town, about three streets over, right on the outskirts. You may find somebody there who can help you. I'll keep your secret, but you should leave this town, Jacob, just as soon as you can. No good can ever come from this place. And just like that, she was gone. Only the smell of her cheap perfume marked her passing. Jacob sat for a while, taking in her words before heading into the street, turning west through the growing shadows. Twenty minutes later, he stood before the ruin of St. Mark's, which slumped in the darkness underfoot at Jacob's approach, as with a sigh, he took in the devastation. Someone did quite the job he whispered to himself, crumbling a piece of burnt charcoal under his nose, not surprised by the smell of gasoline he found there. A tittering cackle came from the shadows, and Jacob's hand flew to his waist. Finding nothing there, he drew a knife from the back of his jeans. Who's there? He called into the darkness. Put up your pig sticker, preacher man. Old Marjorie won't hurt you. Come out where I can see you, Jacob said his eyes searching the darkness. The knife, the voice replied. Put it up, preacher, and come inside. Jacob took a deep breath, sheathed his knife, but kept his hand near as he entered the ruin. A light flared and grew brighter as an oil lamp was lit, driving back some of the gloom. Jacob squinted through the darkness, making out a hunched figure wrapped in tatty old blankets in one ruined corner. As he drew nearer, he saw that it was a woman, Filth streaked with matted white hair. Who are you? He asked, 
stopping only a few steps away. How'd you know I was a preacher? The voice of the dead. I hear him, you see. Cries of all those poor dead children. What dead children? What happened in this place? Seen you, the woman sighed. A shudder racking her scrawny frame. A pale horse, rider in the wilderness. A man driven mad by God. I, I seen you wash in flames, preacher. Marjorie knows. Marjorie has the sight. You're mad. Mad! She hissed, thrushing her face into the light, revealing gaping sockets where her eyes should have been. Jacob swallowed hard but said nothing. Yeah, I she said, retreating back into the shadows. Driven mad by the followers. What followers? Makes sense, woman. Carathon! The woman screamed. They took me down into the darkness. Look! She said, leaping to her feet, throwing off her lice-ridden blanket, revealing her nakedness beneath. There was a flash of steel, and the woman thrust a rusty-looking blade deep into her abdomen, drawing it across, disemboweling herself. Look! She cried, thrusting her filthy hand inside her ruined stomach, blood pouring from her mouth, cascading down her legs like a waterfall. Empty! So empty! There was a sudden loud boom, and a smoking hole appeared in the dying woman's forehead. Jacob spun about with a cry and looked straight into the barrel of the sheriff's revolver. Take him, sheriff said. And the two burly-looking men who came on grinning as Jacob backed up, drawing his knife. Tut, tut! The sheriff laughed. Never bring a knife to a gunfight, boy. Now put it down, or I'll shoot your legs out from under you. For a moment, Jacob was tempted to fight. But with a curse, he threw his knife into the dust. Tie him up, hands behind his back, nice and tight. Tonight, he shall witness the glory of Cathod before I offer him up as a sacrifice to the old one. The hell are you talking about? Jacob cursed as the two men roughly tied his hands behind his back, the rough hemp rope digging rudely into his flesh. Who is that? You'll see, Sheriff sneered. You will see much and know an agony of delicious pain before this night is through. So I promise you. That, I promise you. Bring him, he said to the two men. Congregation awaits. The town was all but deserted as Jacob was half marched, half dragged through the night. Even the body saloon was dark, silent, and not a person moved through the streets. Eventually, they arrived at the steep-sided canal where a small barge lit only by a burning oil lamp awaited them. Get in, Sheriff said, pushing Jacob hard over the edge. With a grunt, Jacob landed hard, groaning. He sat up as the other men leapt aboard, shoving him back down. Get us there, the Sheriff said. The other two men hurriedly took up the oars and began to row through the brackish waters. Soon the stars appeared and were replaced by slime-covered bricks, as the small boat entered a shadowy tunnel, leading beneath the silent town. What is this place? Jacob said, straining at his bonds, but the question was answered by a booted foot. Open your mouth again. I cut out your tongue, Sheriff said, grinning at him ghoulishly. Your heretic voice will not desecrate these sacred caverns. After what seemed like an eternity to Jacob's tired mind, the small boat came to a swaying halt. He was dragged out and thrust onto the stone-cold floor. Cursing, the two men dragged him back to his feet. What he saw then took his breath away. They were in a large, vaulted cavern. Stalagmites grew all about, and strange black crystal formations lay dotted here and about, twisted into tortured forms. But it was not this that instilled such a deep-seated fear in Jacob. At the far end of the room, lit by flickering torches, was a great temple, built into the very bedrock itself, huge spiral pillars rearing into the darkness, highly decorated with twisted, tortured symbols that hurt Jacob's mind just to look at. Welcome to the Temple of Jathat, the sheriff whispered into his ear. The old one awaits inside. Its 
It's harvest time. A time of reaping and gathering. He grows hungry, and his hunger must be sated. Jacob said nothing as he was led inside. Down a dark tunnel, his eyes were moving constantly, yet he kept his demeanor soft, all slumped shoulders and shuffling feet. A broken man was not so closely guarded and could make good use of an opportunity that should happen to arise. The tunnel suddenly ended and the sheriff threw open a large wooden door, blackened with age. Behold, he screamed, the temple of Chithat. Light flooded the tunnel, followed by a hellish chanting, like some terrible drum, charging the air with electricity, making it hard to breathe, causing Jacob's skin to tighten and crawl as he was pushed inside. Everywhere, there were people dressed in flowing red robes, their faces covered in white masks, making them look corpse-like in the flickering light of a thousand torches. At the end of the room was a large stone altar. Behind it, a massive stone well loomed above a screaming woman who sweated, writhed, and twisted. As Jacob was dragged closer, he saw, to his horror, that the woman was in the deep throes of labor. Stood beside her was the high priest, his robes black as midnight, his mask carved with a single terrible glaring eye. The sacrifice approaches, the priest screamed above the thunderous chanting. Reaching between the woman's quivering legs, he tore the newborn child from her, cutting the birthing cord with a small glittering knife. At the sound of the child's first hitching breaths, the whole ground began to shake, and the terrible chanting turned into a screaming deluge as the great jet of filthy water gushed from the sliming busted well, rearing like a column into the fetid night air. Before Jacob's terrified eyes, the churning water began to take on shape, to transform until a great and terrible worm reared above him. Along its segmented body, a thousand blind eyes twitched and turned. Behold, the priest said turning to his congregation. The Great One, Jathat, we bring you sacrifice, Great Lord, he said, raising the bawling child above his head. The creature let out a bellow of triumph, turning its swaying head from which glared a single crimson eye towards the now chanting priest. Its fanged mouth opened, revealing row after row of jagged teeth. It lunged forward, snatching the screaming infant up and down down its throat, silencing its pathetic screams forever. Now, the sheriff said, dragging Jacob forward, you'll make a sacrifice unto him. He'll devour you, heart and soul, and you will live in him forever. What is this? The high priest glared down at Jacob. Another sacrifice, Lord, the sheriff fawned, for the old one is forever hungry. So be it. Bring him to me. Let the old one be fulfilled. Jacob still did not struggle as he was dragged on, but his eyes searched frantically for a way out. Just that, the old priest boomed, turning back towards the swaying worm. Take this one onto yourself. Show him the fate of all heretics. Again, the worm let out a terrible bellow and began his downward strike. Just as Jacob's eyes opened to a nearby oil lamp, with a cry, he pistoned out his leg and shattered the burning lamp against the altar. Immediately, his booted foot and dusty jacket were set ablaze. The great worm tried to rear back, but it was too slow, as with a cry of outrage, Jacob tore a blazing spur across the crimson eye. The great worm screeched in agony and began to mindlessly flail about, crashing into Jacob and his captors, sending them sprawling on the floor, instantly killing the high priest as it writhed and rolled, blind and insane with agony. The room was now in complete disarray. The fire had spread, setting a blaze to the nearby crimson banners, catching on people's clothes as they fled in terror, trying to escape the thrashing worm. Jacob felt the flames burning his back, but did not run, but embraced them, thrusting his bound hands into the flames, ignoring the pain till at last his bounds parted. To his left, the sheriff, torn and bloody, was staggering to his feet. You, he began, but that was as far as he went. 
Jacob closed the distance between them in two angry strides. His hands, fast as lightning, grabbed the sheriff's guns and shot the protesting man twice through the throat. He did not stop there, but turned his outrage upon the fleeing crowd, adding to their terror as he pumped round after round of hot lead into men and women alike. When the guns clicked empty, he turned around, ignoring the hot barrels as he waded in, pistol-whipping them down and beating them with his booted heel as they tried to escape his terrible wrath, all the time making his way towards the waiting exit, dodging the writhing worm. The fallen god, Chithat, whose death throes had started to weaken as the fire burned its vile body, cleansed its filth from the world. At last, he made the doorway and threw himself through the flames, licking at his back. A few of the cultists had also managed to escape and were now fleeing down a small side tunnel. Just then, the earth let out another groan and the tunnel collapsed in a deluge of dust and rubble, burying the fleeing cultists alive. Scrambling to his feet, Jacob jumped into the small boat and grabbed up the paddles, rowing for all he was worth until at last he emerged onto the moonlit night. Praise God, he gasped, leaping from the boat. And just then there was another great rumbling from deep in the ground as a part of the town suddenly tilted. Then with a resounding crash and a roar of flames, it fell into the earth. By the flickering flame light, something seemed to move in the murky water, something long and worm-like gliding through the depths. Jacob blinked his eyes. And it was gone. Enough, he gasped, staggering away. For the love of God, enough. Thumping through the cold night, he headed to the nearby forest, wondering if his God would ever let him rest. And once again, he thought of Jesus asking for the cup to be taken from his lips and laughed. Lord's far from the wicked, he whispered, but here's the prayers of the righteous. The words were taken by the wind and smothered in the darkness. Behind him, Hell's Creek burned through the long night. The evil of Jethat consecrated by righteous flames. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. If you guys are interested in finding audiobooks for me, a brand new audiobook's out. Uh, there's an audiobook. It's Pastel Colored Dreams and Human Flavored Nightmares, written by Vincent Venacava, which some of you might know as a really cool dude that I work with quite often, actually. You can head over to audible.com and find Mr. Creepypasta to see all the audiobooks I've worked on, including Tales from the Gas Station and many, many more. And like always, I want to give a big thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys, as always, are the real MVPs, and I really appreciate it. If you guys want to join them, you can head over to patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta and see all these cool, fine folk. And I'm about to mispronounce the names of here or in the description down below. People such as Jacob Schaefer, Zach, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arce, Ken Lendo Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Melancholy Corpse, Hollow Zero, Ferb, Harley, Tainted Raven, Katie Birch, Sashi Sazaku, Katrina Beasel, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Miss Zandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Eurogore, Suji Campbell, Marco Takes Dabs 420, Stricken, Azreen Fox, Robert White, Andre Garcia, Snails Brennard, Legit Quad Feed, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Chris Lovins, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, 1-800 Nightmare, Unknown Nobody, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Brennan Wright, Someone You Love, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys, as always, for supporting the channel. You're all wonderful. I, I, I love every single one of you guys, for real. You guys help me out so much, as well as everybody down there in the description below, as well as everybody else 
who watches and subs and, and does everything else with this channel. Thank you guys so much. And as always, sweet dreams. <laughs>